you have been busy, John. Have I? Those are photos coming through. Oh, well, that's two, that's two years' work. No, oh, yeah, but you've done some recent ones as well. I like the idea of doing a film out of them. What, the it. photos? Yeah. I don't, I don't know what it would be about. There's no uh, there's no suggestion of narrative, really. Maybe you get Michael Sheen do, to do the um oh. the narration. No fucking way. Get Stephen Fox to write it. Hi, I'm Michael Sheen. <laughs> this is a film about Michael Sheen. I don't know if you know, but I've given lots of money to good causes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I've ever mentioned that. I mortgaged my house so that they could play football. Homeless people could Traps play football. Could play football. <laughs> yeah. That that is Wales. <laughs> Britain, an ancient kingdom with legends of violence, cruelty, and torment in its blood. Join your hosts, Ross, John, and James, as they bravely tread where few would dare. Witness their journey into the horrific history of British horror. They are... The General Witch Finders. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, goblins and ghouls, to the 22nd episode of the General Witch Finders <laughs> podcast. I'm James in Bournemouth in Southern England. I'm John Fountney. I'm still alive. I'm in the south of Wales, which is in South Wales. I'm Ross. I'm in Dorchester, which is in the south of England. And today, in this episode, we will cover the legend of Hell House. What in the name of God? <laughs> What did he do to make this house so evil? Murder, vampirism, cannibalism, drug addiction, alcoholism, sadism, mutilation. How did it end? If it had ended, we would not be here. in there to take over. The house tried to kill me. It almost succeeded. I don't accept this. I do not accept this. Naked. Drunk. Fighting. Oh, please get me out of here. Is that what it's called? Yeah, the legend yeah. of Hell House. <laughs> Hell House. It's not haunted. There's not haunted anywhere. No, it's no. Uh, it's not the house, it... haunting of Hell House. Or yeah, there's it's yeah all the haunting. There's lots of films that's very similar to this. That's the yes. that's the issue, I think. Yeah. And anyway. John, John, yeah. that's what I was just saying to Ross. But it's just while we wait for you to set up the leg end. Of <laughs> that's a very Spoiler. different film isn't it well the ending yeah you know right, so, oh i see i thought yeah. you were, i thought you were implying that eric morcom was going to turn up no. <laughs> well, so, right, we'll get on to that in the fullness of time right so <laughs> the legend of hell house is a 1973 supernatural horror film directed by john how how john how who knows i think he was right. called um i read this and i think he was called um but I might be wrong. Oh, guff. 
No. That's my Carry on, James. <laughs> off. Go off. Go off. Go off. Go off. No, I read somewhere how his name was meant to be pronounced. Okay. Somehow pronounced Guff. How? We'll go- <laughs> <laughs> so, The Legend of Hell House is a 1973 supernatural horror film directed by John Howe and starring Pamela Franklin, Roddy McDowell, Clive Revel, and Gail Honeycutt. It follows a group of researchers who spend a week in Velasco House, the <laughs> Mount Everest of haunted houses, originally owned by. Emmerich Belasco, an imposing, perverted millionaire and supposed murderer whose acts of debauchery were loosely based on the occultist Alastair Crowley. Belasco disappeared soon after. A massacre occurred at the home, and since the house is haunted by the victims of his twisted and sadistic desires, subsequent paranormal investigators to the house have been inexplicably killed. Uh. Matheson's screenplay, based upon his 1971 novel, Hell House, drastically reduced some of the more extreme elements of the novel, particularly Mm. its graphic sexuality and BDSM. It also changed the location of events to England, whereas the novel took place at an estate in rural Maine in the United States. The external shots of the house were filmed at Whitehurst Park, West Sussex. The mansion in the opening sequence is Blenheim Palace. The interior yes. shot of the long room is the palace's library. The role of Belasco was played by an uncredited uh, Michael Goff, who played Alfred in the 1989 Tim Burton Batman. Uh, his part consisted of a couple of recorded lines and an on-camera appearance as an embalmed corpse seated upright in a chair. The film features a score with an electric, electronic music bass line with occasional woodwind and brass stabs. The score and electronic uh, sound effects were created by Delia Derbyshire, the great yeah. Delia Derbyshire, and Brian Hodgson, recorded at Hodgson's Electrophon Studios in London. Hodgson, who created the TARDIS sound effect. Whoa, cool. Imagine having that on your CV. <laughs> Just retire. Uh, <laughs> right, the, the shot of the cat in the opening credit sequence was later used for the Granada Nighttime Ident on the ITV network in the United Kingdom in 1988. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Why not? Cutting measures there. Yeah. Why, why the hell not? Right, yeah. So there you go. That's the preamble. <laughs> this was a very, um, this was a very interesting, odd and strange Bizarre. experience for me watching yeah. this film because I thought, I went into it thinking it was something else. Uh-huh. Mm. I thought it was the one which is like um, Haunted House of... Oh, I don't know what it's called. It's one of these generic titles where people go to a haunted house and then it's like a Cat and, cat and the Canary kind of story where it's like it's none of it's real and it's not a ghost. It's like it's like someone just I think you're of, thinking of the House of Haunted Hill with um, the, the James... The one we went and saw in Chapter and they had a, 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 a skeleton come from the ceiling. Is it black? Was that black, 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 black and white? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I'm thinking of the story of that, which is I really hate that film mm. because it's um, it's really boring, and I don't think it's a real ghost, is it? No, it's um, I, I don't I don't like price, anything. I think, to yes, put them all of course on. it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's the synopsis on Wikipedia. <laughs> it's Vincent Price. <laughs> I've yet to see a film. Oh, anyway, we're we're going up, we're ahead of ourselves. But I'm yet to see a film I've enjoyed with Vincent Price in it. So. We're, we're going to have to oh, find one. Well, maybe that's next time. Next time on um, whatever this is called. This film we was selected by our listeners or by our Twitter. We put up um, three or four films, and this is the one that came up on top. So what was it one nil against, please? Oh, no, it was, it was against... Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had the, the, the Golden Vampire... Oh, um, yes. Kung Fu one. Seven that's Golden Vampires, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, general... Oh, the Witchfinder General... Oh, thank God we didn't have to watch that. And this might be one other as well, but I can't remember. But this is the one that came up on top. Um, a couple of, uh, we've had some people saying they watch this every Christmas. Um, and it seems to be a, a, a very, a very <laughs> popular a film. It is a Christmas film. Yeah. It is a Christmas film. And, um, yeah. As much as Psycho, which is set at Christmas. Ah. And um, Thingy, Die yeah. Hard. Yeah. yeah. But I am, um, from the trailer, I thought this looks incredibly 70s and I, I really like the look mm. of it and when John was yeah. saying oh I hate this film I said I'm surprised because it looks like the kind of thing you might be into so but well, it sounds like you've never actually seen it John I've seen I feel like I've seen the red room where the girl the younger girl sleeps 
but I don't feel like I've engaged with any other part of the film in any way whatsoever, which is quite strange. Um, as, as I watched it, I realised that I'd seen the um, poltergeist dinner party scene. Yeah. That's the, the only thing I was like, oh, I've seen this. This has yes. turned up on things before. The set piece. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it felt to me like the sort of the typical horror uh, sort of haunted house movie. I feel like Trope. this being Absolutely. this this is this has probably been the same story in many other films like the haunting mm. um uh, mm. sort of the one we was talking about earlier which was the uh, uh, uh house on horse hill house on horse hill mm. you know basically people have been asked to go and the, the stay at this house for yes. a certain amount of time either to get some money to get an inheritance or something like that and it's been parodied so many times as well but yes. um, yeah it, it was i think it was a really good example of that type of film I thought, to to kind of say how I feel about the film before we talk about yeah. it, which we don't usually do, but I mm. feel like I should in some way, I felt like that it was a good film, or even potentially a really great film, mm. which kind of let itself down in a few ways. It It posed some really interesting questions, which it didn't answer at all. Mm. I thought the kind of premise of the film was basically the premise of Prometheus. Yes. Which is how they're proving life after death or, mm-hmm. or yeah. that kind of thing, which I was like, I'm on board for this because this is very Nigel Neal. And, mm. and overall, it's a bit stone tapey, isn't it? To the point where you have a van turning up with a load of equipment. Yes. 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 Something industries on the side. But I think ultimately it kind of lets itself down in its execution well, was that, um, yeah, so my, mo- my, my most exciting revelation about the uh, film will come at the end, and that is the resume of the DOP, Mr. Alan Hugh. Okay. So we'll keep that cool. for the, um, that's going to be the big reveal at the end yeah. of this we, review. We, we will, okay, so we start off with... Um, <laughs> a quite remarkable title card. Yeah. No, it's not a title <laughs> card, but like an introductory, like an introductory essay. Which yes. I haven't read. Ross, did you write the whole thing down? Although the story in the, of this film is fictitious, the events depicted involving psychic phenomena are not only very much within the <laughs> bounds of possibility, but could well be true. And, so, I, and, and the man who has said these lines, Tom Corbett, I've written down clairvoyant and psychic consultant to European royalty. Amazing. That's what he what he's, a- and I've just written bollocks. That's it. Just one moment, I just put bollocks. But what are European so royals are left? Exactly. <laughs> Luxembourg, need, the Queen of Luxembourg. We need a psychic Prince consultant right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like um, if, yeah. if we ever make a horror film, guys, we need to yeah. have this at the beginning of it. Yes. Right. Well, but that's, this that's film, thing- although completely fictitious, could actually could turn actually out happen. to be true in some sense. And again, I hate to say, you know, put, putting the philosophy hat on here, but, you know, virtually everything's within the bounds of possibility. Yes. Like the sun could explode tomorrow. That's yeah. within the bounds. Of, it won't happen, but it could happen, right? So just going, this could happen. Well, yeah, everything could happen. That's yes. not really, that's not any real. It's the kind of legalese that our prime minister, current prime minister yes. is so um, yeah, I see proud no, I see no them. evidence of this happening. <laughs> Does that mean it happened? I don't know. <laughs> There was no one there to hear that tree fall over. And I then thought, after that, we're, we're introduced to, well, is he the protagonist? He does it kind of one of the two, you know. Yes, it's interesting that was to see, one of my know, issues with the film. Yeah, you know, who is the lead character in this film, mm. really? But mm. he is a hard, hard-nosed kind of, um, he's a, a physicist. Scientist, more, yeah. he's, a, he's a scientist, isn't he? Mm. And he turns up at what is, obviously we find out it's Blenheim Palace, but obviously an extremely rich looking mansion and a very old man in a wheelchair it's michael gambon-esque mm. michael gambon-esque insists that he, he's like i want you to find out if there's definitely life after death it'll it'll cost you i'm going to pay you a hundred thousand pounds <laughs> and and then he keeps going how could i prove that how can how could, give me the facts <laughs> give me the facts, he keeps saying. And I just thought that's just quite a good tactic, just to sh- keep shouting, keep giving me the facts until the guy just gives up and goes, yeah, all right then. But my first thing was I just thought for that, if he's got that much money, just read mm. some books into it. Why is he, why is he just like, they, what, what are they possibly going to do? Like, look at that. We have managed to conclusively prove there is life after death. There you go. Mm. Yeah, well, you can just Bang. make any shit up because he's like, okay, and then he dies. And then like we, 
yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, like, you're going to ask for money back, isn't you? Well, this is the premise yeah. which I found really interesting. And then when you break it down, it's like, this is what Prometheus tries to do, isn't it? Where mm. you find out that Guy Ritchie has been on the spaceship all along. And then yeah. Guy Ritchie. I, can't, I can't remember exactly what Guy Ritchie's in. Guy Pierce. He's, Guy Pierce. Pierce, not Guy Ritchie. <laughs> <laughs> Guy Pierce, a TV's Mike from Neighbours. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. doc, is he Dr. Mike? Was he a Dr. Mike? Not I really. believe he was, yes. He had a motorbike, didn't he? But um, Yes. So if that's the that's the premise and you're like well that's a really interesting premise for a film so are we we're going to have a quasi scientific angle and then we we're, we're basically um given uh two other mediums yeah, who Cora are and what well, one is a one is she's just a child and then <laughs> the other one is um oh he survived um so that's Roddy McDowell and the little girl from, from the, the innocence, innocence yes my... which really blew my mind my new um, 70s crush. Oh, uh, bloody hell. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. um, I've already put another film with her in on our list of ones to watch later on this year. And what is that one? Uh, it's, what's it called? Um, it's a bad, it's meant to be a bad one. It? No, it's the one where, when they're in France on bikes with... Um, oh, God, that's so boring. I can't <laughs> watch that. <laughs> that's always on Talking Pictures. Has yes. it got Michelle de Tries in as yes, well? Yes, it has, yeah. That's te- it's terrible. We can't watch it. You, so yeah, so we've got we've got our dream team of the very uncharismatic lead man who yes, I can't remember his name. I can't remember what he looked like, and I think that's the that's one of the main failings of the film, isn't it? Where this guy, you need him to be kind of charismatic and um, something sympathetic just, in some yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, he's not anything at all, really, and he's very like a very poor comparison of our friend in the stone tape mm-hmm. um, mm. is that kind of <laughs> you know what a rat sounds like boy. Like, here we go we've got to tick that one off the list <laughs> but, and then he's, so he's, of, he, he's led out of the um the the mansion by the the guy from um to the manor born big big mm. peter balls yeah a very mm. big he's, yeah he's a big lad big, he's about two so foot taller yeah I so i've said I thought... here peter balls looks um groovy in this because <laughs> he's he looks more her suit and 60s mm. than Peter Bowles usually looks. Yes. Um, we've, we've covered Peter Bowles, but we've never covered Peter Bowles directly, have we? I think we've covered him in... Um, we, we mentioned him last time. We've that, mentioned him time. in Stigma a few times yeah. where um, he's driving an antique dealer's Volvo and his wife dies because nice. someone's <laughs> dug a stone up in her garden. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I'm like, oh, exciting, Peter Bowles in this. And then he's in it for two scenes, isn't yeah, it? And guys, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he and he has a credit, which is like, yeah, what? Like he's he's built one, one, one of the six stars. people in it, yeah, yeah. And then it's like he's never in it again. Like I could have been in this film and had a starring credit, basically. Wow. Um, I've got to say, every time I go on IMDb, it keeps it keeps trying to get me to look at more uh, stuff on Clive Extra. Swift. No. Oh, <laughs> every time I I go on to um, Amazon, I, it tells me I want to watch Extra again, which I really don't want to watch Extra again. Um, so they turn up to, they're kind of put together a bit like um, the team in um, The Wild Geese or something, aren't yes. they? Like they're picked up from uh, the a station. Di- it's a dirty dozen, yeah, yeah. yeah but there's some it. great 70s photography in this, though. There's some amazing... Yes, yes. Like, well, cl- you really? wait till you hear about the photography at oh, the end, Cleve. It's like very unnatural sort of close-ups of people's faces, sort of like mm. trains going past and then people walking into shot. It's, it's like yes. something like, like the French Connection or something. It's, it's very, very stylishly shot. And, and, and nice mm. um, uh, sans-serif uh, sort of captions for like the date nice and the ca- time. The slick direction is not down to the director. That's all I want to say. Uh, I'm no. really going to big up Alan Hume at this point again. You wait till you hear this resume. It's going to blow your tiny mind. <laughs> okay. But it does look great. And it just, whatever lenses they're using, just makes something feel sort of very strange. It's got well, they're very, very, almost like fisheye. Yeah. Um, mm. Wide angle lenses, aren't they? Which were very new at that point in the 70s. Yeah. New on probably cost a bloody fortune to, to hire from Panavision or whoever it was at that point. I just love the way people just sort of walk into frame and it's just, just like their full face. It must have looked amazing on the big screens they yeah. would have had in the Yes, s- definitely, definitely. So I've, I've noticed that as we're kind of, as they're putting the team together, we're finding out more about this house. And this thing is, they, they said, oh, um, the last time somebody tried, you know, people tried to stay in this house, 
eight people died. Eight of them. Eight. So you just think, <laughs> this would be such a massive story. No one yes. seems to give a shit. Yeah. And I'm like, eight, if eight people die anywhere in this country at one yeah. point, it'd be like, ooh, that's a bit odd and a bit funny. Well, it was like, oh, yes, eight people died. Only, yeah. only uh, one of them got away. We're about to go and pick them up yeah. now. Yeah. And, and, and then no one asked them about it. Like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> this was my big thing. My yes. big problem was I thought immediately he's going to say, so I say, sorry, I should say who he is. He is Fisher, the mm. only survivor of the last mm. time they went in there. Mm. Um, it's Roddy McDowell, Planet of the Apes is Roddy McDowell. Yeah, and his and voice written, all the way through is basically Caesar's voice from yeah, Planet of the Apes. Isn't absolutely. It? <laughs> and I've put that it, he looks eerily like the uh, mass murderer, Dennis Nielsen. <laughs> I was going to say... <laughs> For, for the whole of this, he's dressed like a TV pedophile, isn't he? He is! Like, right, he's got, so- like, a horrible... He's got, like, Roy's Rolls kind of um, anorak on. Um, <laughs> like, um, jam jar bottom glasses. Well, yeah. He yeah. just looks... He but this, just but looks this like was 20 creep. years ago when he, when he was there before, so how old is he meant to be? Yeah. Well, he was there in 1953, was he, or yeah. something like that? Yeah. So, so, yeah, his age is very weird. And what, what I thought was weird about when they're putting this team together is that, that McDowell is just picked up from the station or somewhere like mm-hmm. that. But the girl, the younger girl, is picked up from a graveyard. Yeah. It's yeah. the implication that she lives in a graveyard. Well, she's a medium, isn't she? She's just like... <laughs> it's just stupid. Um, she's a mental medium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what's, she's point. a mental medium. He's a physical medium. Physical. Yeah. Medium. Mm-hmm. Um, so, or they're both liars. I love her outfit. I love her sort of sort of the big, massive, white, curvy collar, collar she had like on the Puritan. Um, yeah. Puritan, puritanical collar. Um, I think when they get to the castle or whatever it's meant to be, as they're walking in, I think I spotted two of the prop eagles from um, Castle Dracula in the Hammer Dracula oh, of 1958. Oh, spot. I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know if any of our listeners can qualify that statement, but but I think that's what I saw. Pop it on INDB as a, as a, as a bit of trivia, uh, you know, uh, that. Does that happen? Is that how you yeah, use you can just, IMDb? Yeah, you can, just, you can just put that on there, and then people say if they find it interesting or not. Oh, or find it, or find it true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that then that's when we get the credits. All of that was the yes. Yes. Free secret. credit sequence. Yeah. Yes. So we finally get some music, and I have to say from the outset, brilliant. It, the music is brilliant. What you hear, yes. but there isn't enough music, is mm-hmm. there? No. Because this kind of <laughs> music. <laughs> starts and you're like whoa that's like mad cool. funky yeah. kind of weird and then it just goes and you don't hear it again then until the end of the film do you no. really there's very little this is just sound like weird kind of like tones after yes that, isn't there's, it? there's very little what you call incidental music no. uh which is quite disappointing um <laughs> After this point, it's pretty much you're in the house for the rest of the film, which I yeah, found yes. that, that was quite because a bit the, much. the stuff we're watching up until now has just been lo- you know loads of different locations and all yeah. that kind of stuff. This is where it became become it felt a little bit low budget after that point. Yes, but that's an amazing scene when they open the door for the first uh, shot and they open the door for the first time. They're just silhouetted in the doorway, and you got all the light. Mm. That's really it's really cool. They say uh, when they walk in, they go oh. The atmosphere in here. And I just thought, yeah, that's just the dry ice. <laughs> There's a lot of dry ice when they walk in. It's like, that's not really atmosphere, that's dry ice. <laughs> so the, I, I had a real problem with the dialogue all the way through. Mm. Um, there's a lot of, like, inconsequential dialogue. There's a lot of pointless screaming. And at this point, when they first go in, the younger girl, whose name I can't remember, Miss something. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I should get the RMDB up tonight. <laughs> So the girl, well, from, the inno- the girl yeah. from the innocence goes something like blah, 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 pest hole. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then another thing, there, there was an awful lot of really weird lines. Like um, someone would say, oh, um, oh, I don't understand. Or I, yeah, I know what you mean about this terrible place. And then the other person would go, I don't know if you do. <laughs> and it's like this weird kind of open-ended just a silly 
it's just like bad writing, isn't it? And there's too many of those. Mm-hmm. Loaded. Yeah, loaded yeah, ta- yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, so Pamela some- Franken plays Florence Tanner. That's Florence. Tanner. So That's it's Miss it. Tanner, isn't yeah. it? Yes, 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 yes. I, I found being someone who knew nothing about this film whatsoever and just go, going into it cold, what yeah. I found was like they kept, or they, like, I thought, well, what's the point of this film? Is it like they're trying to definitively prove that ghosts exist? Yes. Because then, like, after about 10 minutes, they kind of go, oh, yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> but they're, they're not doing anything. This, yeah. They basically just have dinner and just sit yeah. around. Yeah. They're not doing any yeah. experiments or anything. This, are they? This, that is my this, problem with the whole film. And what I've written at the end is why. Because <laughs> yeah. they, they basically prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there ghosts, ghosts. exist. Yeah. And the machine, give, given the opportunity, will vanquish ghosts. And that's mm. fine. Shit but it's just buses. like, it's just like, there's that, that it, uh, it, it's not, it's not, um, uh, ca- let's carry on anyway. Right. <laughs> I'm going to say how much £100,000 from 1973, <laughs> how much, much. was? Um, was it £100,000, was it? Um, yes. so they were all, yeah, they were all getting 100 grand each. And does, um, does the American lady get t- double because her husband has died? Or yeah. does she get any? Because she wasn't offered any money at no, all, money was she? Is, yeah. She was just there with him. Um, what's, is it Candice Glendening? What's her name? I can't remember the American lady's name now. Let's have a look. Uh, it's not Candice Glendening, is it? Ga- uh, her name, in it, she was Gail, Gail Honeycutt. Honeycutt. Yes. yes. Yep. Sorry, and, okay, what's it? I think... So how much was £100,000? I think it was quite a lot of money at that That's point. A lot. A lot of money. £100,000 is £1,288,635. Mm. So they're all getting just over 1. a million. 1.2 million. Yeah. A million, yeah. which isn't a huge amount, is it, to put your life on the line? <laughs> Whenever people say, would you do that for a million pounds? I'm like, yes, I'd probably do it for £100, you know? <laughs> Whereas I would just be like, probably not, no. <laughs> I've got things to do. But um, when they go into the chapel, I think that's very, very slick. Mm-hmm. The camera work is excellent. They go in, there's a really good sense of um, uh, dread. Yes. I but, think the... I think sort of the like they're moving a, cat, uh, a, a torch around and you see lots of kind of... Yeah, sort of, weird. Um, Paintings macabre paintings and stuff, and stuff. You? but the um the young psychic won't go in there, will she? No. I can't remember what was the reason no. she gives. She just it gave her the willies. Too much, yeah, this yeah, is too much. It's overwhelming going in there. I think the film works really well aesthetically, but I think the scripting and the it's, kind of oh. pacing and the plotting oh, is yeah. dreadful. So it's Agreed. a good watch aesthetically, but in terms of like. Watching a film with narrative is it's again. Really, do you think? Would you rather, yeah. rather be in a nineties nightclub with the with Doctor Fibes up on the screen That's or a Legend of Hill? Of I, 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 I think have Doctor this. Fibes. Oh, oh really, well, James? No, 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 no. Not in terms of it, it's a better film. I'm just thinking in a nineties nightclub. Fibes oh, in a club, better. yeah. You're more like yeah, Doctor Fibes. Oh no, no, yeah, this, yeah. This, this, it, this was it, yeah. It, it, it. I was listening to Geneva. Was it Geneva the other day? Do you remember Geneva? Yeah. Well, by Gene. Yeah. No, no, is that a band? No, Geneva? Geneva were a band. Oh, okay. Yes, they're very much like a bit of a kind of um, actually like sub early verve kind of um, feel to them. But I was thinking maybe a bit of Geneva would be good J- over J- James um, is Dr. Nod- Vibes. James is nodding sagely. Sagely, yeah, yeah. I remember I Geneva. Remember those yeah. days. I met so them in the Good months. Mixer in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> That was salad. Outside, <laughs> it was outside the British Museum. Um, I went to the British Museum um, oh. uh, over Christmas with the kids, and I said, last you? time I was here, I, um, I was here with with John, Simon, and Adam, and um, oh a flasher was uh, was being chased out of the the um the front doors <laughs> after exposing himself to some schoolgirls. I don't remember that. Yeah, part. and Adam, did, was, did, Adam is what, that not you? the is that not the start of like a. James Bond film. No, or something. we we went there. We left Adam in one room. We went around the whole museum. museum. Came back. He yeah. was still looking at the same case. We said we're leaving now, and he was furious. <laughs> oh uh, Jesus, Ross! While you were there, did you go and see the Sutton Who horde? No, we oh, did. Oh, oh, oh. I should have done. No. Like, it would have merged with my face, and I would have become some kind of Love like it. Saxon re- animated cool. Saxon uh-huh. king, wouldn't I? Yeah. Uh, we just went and looked at um, not mummies, mummies, mummies. 
Miss Tanner? I'm over here. You shouldn't have done that, Miss Tanner. You caused us undue alarm. I'm very sorry. I heard a voice in here. Welcome to my house. I'm delighted you could come. I'm certain you will find your stay here most illuminating. Think of me as your unseen host and believe that during your stay here, I shall be with you in spirit. May you find the answer that you seek. It is here, I promise you. And now, I'll feed it then. I'll be to them. Until we meet again. The record wasn't meant for us. What made the record go on by itself? Velasco said he could will people to a particular object, then move among them unobserved. I doubt that. Do you? Our attention was on that a few moments ago. How do you know he didn't walk right by us? They, they find a, a vinyl sort of like welcome to the house, which I think is yes. a, a great thing, which I might get pressed for it's myself. A, again, it's a very good touch, but goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, again, I've seen so many films like this where mysterious people are taken to a place they're told something is happening, and then there's a recorded message played to them, particularly Agatha Christie's um, one. Oh, what's it called? I'm not, yes, it's that one, but it's called something else. The film is called something else, and I'm not going to say the original title. Oh, no. so <laughs> it's deeply racist. Mm -hmm. But there's one. Cancelled. Yeah, there's one. <laughs> what's it called? It's got Oliver Reed in, and like. Elk, and elk then there, summer. And then, and then there were, then there were there none. Was one. Or yeah, there, and, and then, then there, there was one. Is that what? what yeah. Or, or none. So basically, right. that's that. The preamble, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Where someone, hello, I'm Orson Welles. Welcome to my house. I think it was Orson Welles or someone like that in that version. Well, it's Magnum, wasn't it? So, <laughs> so you've got this kind of. Um, um, I don't know if they're trying to nod to other things or if they're basically just ripping off other ideas. It's quite hard to tell, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you never know. Because a lot of the times we think the stuff we're watching is ripping off other things, but it, but it actually happened first. Because, mm. Yeah. But they yes. are... Yeah. They do tend to just sit around, or just yeah. chatting. There then, is a lot of chat in this. And at that point, it was really reminding me um, of The Exorcist, mm -hmm. where before stuff happens in The Exorcist, there's just a lot of talking, isn't there? And not much goes on. Mm. And it's this kind of building of atmosphere. And then what also made me think of The Exorcist were there's a scene where they have the kind of um, first kind of uh, medium S seance thing, thing, seance thing. Mm. And the 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 Miss Tanner that starts talking with like this other disembodied voice. Yes, so I loved I love that. It's great. That's really exorcist -y. Terminations and extremities. I don't know if thine eye offend thee. Why are you here? Does no good. Nothing changes. Nothing. Get out or I'll hurt you. I can't help myself. God damn you, you filthy son of bitches! God damn you! I don't want to hurt you. But I must, I must. Get out of this house before I kill you all! 
and oh. touch of the Enfield Pulsar guys. Yeah, yes. Real, 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 years ahead of time. Yes, real to real tape recorders being yeah, yeah, yeah. used in full effect as well. Mm-hmm. Is this when the ectoplasm comes out of her as yes. well? Oh no, that's, See, like that goes, goes, that's when they it, put her into like a cage, isn't it? To do an experiment on her. Yeah. See, once again, at that point, they're doing the are ghosts real? Let's find out. Let's do an yes. experiment. Yeah. Which at and this then, point, it's it's all making sense, and it all feels like it's building on something. So, yeah, yeah. But then it just, it really does. Who voted for this, Cleves? Do you know who actually just a, voted just a range for this? Of Show us the name. A <laughs> range, a range of how many people, Cleves? I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it was three people. No, it wasn't. <laughs> we had at least Six. over a dozen. Oh, t- you're joking? Yeah, we are that popular. How many? Internet. How many? Um, Relative. Um, Twitter profiles have you got, please? <laughs> yeah. So. They, uh, so yeah, I'm. I'm going to find it hard to follow the narrative now because I didn't follow the narrative, and I started writing things like Pamela, Pamela Franklin is the girl from the Innocent. Because, <laughs> well, they, they had the seance in front of the yeah. fire. She he she seems to be become possessed by something and basically yes. tells them all to go away. Go away. Yeah, and then she goes off to. Oh yes, I will kill you. Go away. Exactly. Exactly. She goes off to the red bedroom, and then we have like um, doors opening and closing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Again, when you're watching this, you got to think that when this is good because it's all happening physically, and Mm. you know people would have been impressed by this Mm. at at the time. But I I still think my 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 main issue is that sometimes things like this room were a bit too brightly lit. It would have been smooth. Yeah, I, I felt that there was, apart from them walking in going, look at the atmosphere, all oh, the atmosphere in here. I thought, it was quite nice. Mm. <laughs> you know, there's, there's worse places. They said, it's oh, quite stay garish, there for five isn't days. it? So I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah. And then it's they go- garish in a way that, a bit like Dr. Dr. Five is garish, and it's mm. kind of like, it's trying to be like a bit kind of... Psychedelic. Like, well, like, ro- yeah, like a bit like a rock opera. It looks a bit like Tommy mm. or something. Mm. Again, it's a bit Ken Russell. Yeah. Um, but then they have the next night. They have the uh, the the second séance, and this is where they put her into like a cage to stop her being able to uh, manipulate them, the the uh, her surroundings. The and lights. then they have this kind of like ectoplasm come out of her fingers. I don't remember it being in a cage at all. Yeah, it's, it's all, <laughs> a cage or some kind of like veil well, like, around her like, or something. Yeah, yeah. Like Hannibal Lecter like mu- in the cage. Like, no, no, it's like like a muslin sheet, isn't it? Yeah, like, you know, it's not. Mm. Yeah, and then like a bird cage. And he's going. He's yeah. telling it to cut, go into the jar. They're trying to get him to. The ectoplasm. Ectoplasm oh, the ectoplasm, jar. yes. Yeah, so they can get a hold of that. It's not a euphemism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come into the jar. The jar. Rub, the, <laughs> rub the lotion in its skin. So the one bit that, that I feel that we need to divulge before we get onto mm. the end of the climax of this film is that we learn that the guy who owned the house, Alistair Crowley, standing. We're told that he was six foot five. Oh, yes, yes. yes and yeah. a giant man. A giant. What did they call him? The demon. Roaring Giant. Giant. Yes. <laughs> That's right. It's like, oh, okay, right, fine, no problem. Right. Mm. So, but they, that will come back to us later. They also say, what on earth did they do? Well, what did he do in this house? Yes, to this make is a good it list, so James. Evil. And he goes, yeah. what did he do? Well, he, invo- he was involved in alcoholism. Drug taking, drug taking, sexual perversions, and I thought this all sounds quite good fun. <laughs> only, Bestiality, gets, yeah, yeah. Then I was like, mm, I now. but the start, off, I thought it sounds like quite a good weekend treat. <laughs> yes, I thought that bit. To, I think to that point is where it's a good film, and you're like, this is going somewhere. I think after that, it really loses uh, its thread because it's mm. like. At this point, you feel like you're building towards right. We, we're going to have we're going to have something here where either ghosts are disproved, mm. and the skeptic is proved, or ghosts are proved, and there is the interest in that kind of um, middle ground where often you have a situation where the skeptic is kind of thinks they're proved right, but actually. You have this kind of disclaimer at the end that uh-huh. there is, uh, dun, 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 dun. yes, yeah. but that doesn't really happen with this because it all starts to go a bit mad now, doesn't it? Yeah, and well, I'm, it's a kind of like a red talk- herring about this Daniel Belesco. Oh, which is, the, which is the, like, the, Dan- the sun, the, the sun part is just nonsense. He sort of gets it? in and out of her bed and stuff like yeah, that. Of yeah, the, yeah, um, yeah. And, and they reckon w- w- Wikipedia thinks it's because she's sexually repressed that she's sort of manifesting oh. all this yes. kind of stuff. Oh. But then. 
they start saying it's not real, and then this is when we have the poltergeist table jumping up well, and down. And that's yes. right. And, yeah. Big so there's piece. some good effects when they're having their dinner, isn't there? Where where um, she blows like the meat dish at him, yeah. and like a chandelier nearly falls on him, and there's a, a big lot of load sh- of fire comes out. Yes. The uh, the, the, the chandelier drop yeah. is the most the most popular effects <laughs> in this film. <laughs> Numerous people are attacked by. And chandeliers. you know who's upstairs though. It's yeah. Del Boy and Rodney. Boy and Rodney. Yeah. <laughs> um, ready, Del Boy. What, we have, I, I said, oh, should we show the kids um, Only Fools and Horses? And oh, then God. we put on, it was a sex doll one. It was like, oh, I, don't, I don't think this is... Well, I don't think this is... And this, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I said, well, we need to turn this off. There's too yeah. many questions are going to be asked about this. So I think at, at this point, after that, I've written erotic dream, hallucination, Mucky bucks. <laughs> mucky and this bucks. Is, oh, this books. is where this is where it's, it goes wrong for me. Is you've got mucky bucks, and you've got um, it just goes like it just goes weird at this point. It goes like the um, like, the dream sequence in Ghostbusters. Where, yeah. Where, where so um, having, having, having a blowjob from a ghost, which every time the kids go, "What's happening?" And we go, "I don't know." <laughs> oh, <laughs> ghosts. <laughs> so basically. Um, what's her name again? Not Candice Glendening. That's another film star. Tana. From this era. No, no not Tana. Or the, wife. the other lady. The wife, the wife lady. <laughs> the wife of the scientist. What's her Gail name? Gail Honeycutt. Gail Honeycutt, Gail yeah. Honeycutt. So Gail Honeycutt, um, her husband's asleep. She starts to get a bit racy. Um, she sees some weird shadows, like silhouettes on the shade oh, in the woods of Cliff Richard oh, Aura. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then she goes downstairs and tries to... Th- she sees some mucky bucks in the um, cupboard then. Um, and then she, I think she tries, does she then go and try and offer herself to Roddy McDowell? Roddy yeah. McDowell. Yeah, she does. She, yeah. She's barking up the wrong tree with Roddy McDowell. I McDowell. do want to point out <laughs> massively. Lifelong bachelor, Roddy McDowell. Yeah. Who's replenishing they- the booze in the cupboards? But she goes, that's where she <laughs> finds the, um, the mucky books. And later on, you find, there's another scene when you see there's a glass full of booze, which has been there for at least... 30 years which hasn't been dissipated <laughs> yeah. or evaporated it, it's better that it's a strange house that you're meant to think of like have people been living there or has it been empty I, or i like the um the thing about the, all the windows being bricked up yes was, uh, was that to keep things out or keep things in i think so he dun, couldn't dun, dun. see out i think mm. um then um there's the bad really bad effect that doesn't seem to go anywhere with a cat Yes, yes. <laughs> this is the best bit. This is the best bit. And this um, is the this is the hinge of the film where it's like that shouldn't have been put in because it looks like a woman wrestling with a toy cat. A, a cat. It, really, they, they throw at her at one point. Yeah. <laughs> the, but the best. So yes, we should point out that the young medium Tanner, um, yes. as part of her ongoing kind of oh uh, kind of strange relationship with the poltergeist of the you know the, of the sun. Um, yeah. All of a sudden, it, it kind of there, the, or it, how I read it anyway, was that like the go- the ghost had taken over a cat, yeah, and it then starts attacking her. And as John says, an amazing scene, which is clearly a toy cat of her just yeah. like holding it, going Woo! <laughs> like this with it, and then it, like it would cut to another shot where she like tries yeah. to get away from it, and obviously off camera, someone's thrown this toy cat at yes. her again. And, and then there's a real cat it. just kind of stumbling yeah. around. Yeah, then which... every now and then cuts to a slightly confused looking real cat. But then the best bit is, is she then runs into the bathroom to get away from it. It's going, <laughs> it's making like the weirdest cat noises ever. And when she's in the bathroom, she goes, oh, and it's like paws are coming yeah. out of the door. <laughs> like, <laughs> two <laughs> two felt covered paws. Yes. <laughs> I, just, I was like, ah, I thought it was hot. You know, it's not the exorcist this, is it? No. Like, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Where at the start, it's got a claim to be a very good for me. It's a very interesting kind of um, uh, hybrid between quite a modern horror film, which has got this kind of quite believable pseudo scientific thing, and it's quite well put together. And then you've got scenes like this where it's just absolute cobblers, where it's full on, yeah, like Roger Corman level of rubbish effects, mm. yeah, um, and and that really lets it down. Uh, that's when at this moment I've written Deutsche Industries stone tape question mark question yeah. mark yeah. because this is where we see a van delivering the machine which is going to um, reverse the polarity Dude. of the neutron flow yes. isn't it oh, isn't that because po- this a is... popular 
um, being popular by um, John, John Pertwee. John, John. Pertwee. Yeah. Right. It, n- n- only mentioned, I would say, in later episodes. So, Never mentioned in, say, his first story, Spearhead from Space or oh. something like that. <laughs> was there something special about that, John? Well, it was the only one shot on 16 millimeter. Oh, um, okay. So oh, it's, interesting. It's, it looks really good on Blu-ray. It's the only one that can be done in HD. Okay. Um, we, should come, we should look at that one time. 625 okay. line video, I think. Yeah. Anyway. I, or 525, I can't remember. So yeah, in, t- in terms of plot, the uh, uh, you know the, the cynical scientist has said, and this is when it gets like pseudo sciency. Yes, he kind of suggests that it's not actually ghosts, but what it is is um, like a- electromagnetic residue. Yes, is what he says, isn't it? Like all he- all living things create a field of electromagnetism. Yes, and it is my belief that because of the events, the horrific events in this house. That there's an excess of electromagnetism, yeah. which as which energy which can't be John, destroyed, can it? Right, yeah. Right, so as well, that's Einstein. Yeah, that's that's Einstein's theory, and that's what a lot of people have said about ghosts. Is that mm. once you die, the energy of your death? And I've written this down somewhere about Einstein. Um, this is, uh, and this is there's a Daphne du Maurier um, novella called The Breakthrough, which is all mm. about this kind of trying to capture the. Um, have you got the recent reissue of it, please? Yeah, that's oh. the, I've got the same one. I bought it on my birthday a few years ago. It's a, have you read that, James? No. Oh, you'd love that. It's brilliant. Oh, cool. It's really, really good. So it's basically about this... this research, it, it's very Nigel Neal. It's about this research institute, postal, isolated. Mm. And they're basically trying to... There's a boy there who's got terminal cancer, and they're trying to... Once he dies, they're trying to, like, capture the energy of his spirit Beam. within the yeah. machine um which is a the kind of thing that i really love these kind of ideas in science fiction horror but in this film they totally muff it up yeah and it's just you're like oh this could be so nigel neil and actually it's um it's a bit carry on screaming and i yes. wonder why it's carry on screaming we'll come to that later oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there, there do seem to be an, an- interminable amount of scenes from the here on in of like every now and then miss tana just goes screaming <laughs> yeah, yeah like screaming I, everyone yeah. runs to her room yeah only to and, and that's when i was like there's no act, any real kind of horror suspense so, or oh, horror now what there's yeah, no you know, horror there's no build-up yeah of suspense in well, any just, way she does find or... the um like the the corpse of uh, a skeleton yeah. bricked up oh yeah room. that's quite good yeah. but once you find the reveal of who the baddie is who is that corpse? I don't know. It feels like it's not explained. But there's a night because that's meant to be the sun. But then you, they're like, there isn't a sun. I think it's it was like- a red herring. But I like the bit when, <sighs> but like, it's like she's been sexually uh, attacked. But when they go in there, she's sort of like giggling and, and all like. Oh yeah, that bit. That was exorcisty, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, well. that's uh, very exorcisty. I don't. When what came first, the exorcist or this? this. Or were they? Was this. it really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. year was Actually, the Exorcist? It's it's. Hang on, it's. I've, I've got it right here. Because <laughs> this was seventy three. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yeah, filmed so in seventy two. So this was shot in seventy two. It's it's right on top of a copy of Zardoz. Which <laughs> oh, <I was> Jesus <laughs> yeah. Christ! Which I only found out very recently because I've never seen it. Is Wizard of Oz? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's up never seen nineteen seventy three. Ah, interesting. So could Zardoz be um classed as British horror? No. <laughs> it's but science it's fiction, a remarkable it? film. Every, you've got everyone needs to watch Zardos at least once in your life. <laughs> it's, it's incredible, right? And it, but so um, I thought you were going to say then, at least once a year. Then <laughs> no, no, Christ, no. Right? Uh, and then uh, what? Some point as well. There's some kind of psychic shenanigans, and I've just put that Roddy McD- the, the shot is Roddy McDowell suddenly like wakes up and yes. sits and starts forwards. screaming. Ah, but I put remarkable boss-eyed acting. Yes. <laughs> it goes like, it goes like properly boss-eyed. At that point, my tea was ready and I paused it and <laughs> Hell came in and I was like, oh, that's a good freeze frame. To pause it on. It's just his, his cross-eyed screaming face. I think up to this point, Roddy McDowell is really underused and mm-hmm. he only comes into, he's the only thing which salvages like the last third well, of the Well, they're trying to it? make it say so that he's trying to close himself off. He just wants to like, yes, like, coast it out to get the money and but and none of that is really explained is it really no but they kind of no. yeah, because he, but they say that you've got to sort of open yourself up in order for this 
I can't remember to, to work. work. To work, yeah. No, yeah, yeah but why? <laughs> this is the thing with this film. It's like all of the things they say, they never say why. And that's the issue that mm. it, to suspend your disbelief, you've got to be told, you know, even though it's absolute bollocks, I need to be given a reason why mm. X, Y, and Z is happening. And, and yeah. it, the film never gives you that. And that's why ultimately it falls down. Um, and I've written at this point, not quite sure where the narrative is going, McDowell no. screaming. <laughs> yeah. But then we um, have the, um, the young Miss Tanner goes off into the, the chapel where she's been trying not to go into it. And then young she... Miss Tanner sounds like an, a character from um, Are You Being Served? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and it all, all hell um, breaks loose. And then like the, the crucifix falls on top of her and yes. kills her. Which, and quite really nice, horrific. Blood out, yeah. the, out the yeah, mouth yeah, or something. Yeah, that's well done. Yeah, and she sort of leaves like a symbol on the a, cross. Yes, in, she in writes blood. a B yeah. on the cross. Um, and I can't remember why. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I can't. I, at what, I'll explain at why what, at the end, yeah. At what point is it that um, the machine comes and um, the wife goes up to the main guy and says, um, is there anything I can do to help? And he goes, no, it's just too complicated. <laughs> well, it's bear like in mind a that, like, stupid woman. Like, like, yeah, first of all, he's like, no, don't come along to this. And she's like, yes. oh, but I want to see you prove your theory. theory. Like, all right, then. So, yes, uh, James, what's the theory? theory. <laughs> exactly, it never told. Never then explained. you're not told what the theory is, and he doesn't prove it. But basically, like, no. I'm hoping I might get to have sex with someone else. <laughs> it might be in the house. That, that's even, a, even a gay man. Yeah. <laughs> and you, whilst possessed. And yeah. you know I'll, I'll be possessed because I'll be ever so slightly sweaty. Yeah. Which is, I, as um, everyone knows, the sight of a, a bit possessed of white person. face paint on. Yeah. But um, when um, Miss young, young Miss Tanner gets killed, yeah. you think, what happens? Do they call the police? Do no. They, 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 no. Just, they once just again, carry as, on. With, as with the eight people who died before, no one seems to care. No, no one's particularly no. bothered that people have died. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so he then uh, the scientist then says, "All right, I'm going to turn on this machine that's then going to wipe out the um, the electromagnetism in here, and mm. we'll all be fine." So everyone, well, out we go. And so he turns on the machine, erases tape, basically. It's what they we and we know from we know from stone tape that doesn't work. That don't mm. work, right? Never so work. and then in they come back, and then for a minute it looks like, ha ha, everything is fine. Oh, look at that. And Roddy McDowell is like, I can't believe it. It's worked. There's, mm. not, there's yes, nothing there's here. There's nothing in the house. <laughs> you know, remarkable. <laughs> and then, it, or you think, oh, well, you know, you could just tell the fact that there was still like 15 minutes of the film left to go. But I thought well, that's <laughs> wrapped up. Even for this bizarrely plotted and uh, kind of structured film, even I oh. thought, no, 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 they're not, they're not ending it like this. And lo and behold, the machines, no. uh, the scientist machine starts peeping and like, whoa, there's still something here. And he declares, I yeah. do not accept this. I do not accept <laughs> this. And then the machine explodes on him. Yeah. Thus kind of yes. kind of killing him. And then we find his his wife, the possess you know, the, the previously possessed wife, and Roddy McDowell, then mm. find his body. Again, with a chandelier on top of him, for good measure. <laughs> mutilated. It's horribly like, oh mutilated. Oh, my God. Oh. But how has he got from there into the chapel at this point? Not no explanation. Not, not explained. <laughs> and then with that, like, Roddy McDowell goes, oh, now I see it. And then sort of like the, the point of the film, I guess, he's like, I, it, it required both your husband and Miss Tanner. They both had parts of the puzzle, but now, you know, that whole kind of, Combining rationalism and empiricism, mm. you know, combining the scientific view with the psychic view, I've figured out the truth. And what he says is, the ghost or whatever it is is kept here in the mm. chapel. Mm. It's all kind of the, the the chapel is the epicenter for it. How he's worked it out, we don't know though. Do yeah, we? yeah, he's again, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's no kind of a. But don't you see? He's just like, but yes, of course. And now I realize that, you know, he was just yeah. here and he was, and then he was like, and I think I know why. Oh, well, first of all, as well, the, um, the, the now widow says to Roddy McDowell, just, let's just go. Let's just, let's get out of here. And his explanation I've put down here is, if I leave now, my entire, my whole life will have been a failure. He yeah. says, I say, it's a bit overdramatic, mate. You know, kind of don't beat yourself up for that. Why? Yeah. You know, you were lucky to survive last time. You're going to get a hundred grand out of this. Just go. Just clear <laughs> off. 
But he was like, if I, I, my life will be a failure otherwise. And then she's like, oh, okay. Fine. But they keep showing the date and the time as if there's like a countdown for something. But yes. it's, that's yes. just when the guy from the Man of is going to pick them Bones up. Is, yeah. 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 So yeah. It's just weird that they, that, that it's like, we've got to get this done by a certain date. By this time. Point. Yes. Yeah. I quite so, liked that gimmick, but I don't know why. It just made it feel a bit more. A bit more like a quasi-documentary kind of thing yes. at first, yes, but after that it goes say, a bit yeah. wrong. So why yeah, is the beat? Yeah. Why does he write B in blood on the crucifix? Because this is the, the, the revelation is you find, he goes, ah, oh, it turns out we thought there were loads of different ghosts. There weren't. There was one. It's just mm. the main guy. Belasco. Whatever his name. Yeah, it's just Belasco. Mm. And that was her symbol. She wrote B and wrote mm. and then put it in a circle. And then he starts Thus taunting that ghost, doesn't he? That's right. And he goes, so therefore it's just you, Belasco, isn't it? And I think I know why. Because you you were you thought yourself a giant. You're not a giant. <laughs> and then, you know, Ronnie McDowell is then being be- sort of beaten up by a wind machine. Like a wind <laughs> yeah. machine keeps throwing him backwards. And Roddy does a great goes, job at this point, doesn't he? I he does. Think. He throws himself into it. Mm. It's for, max, maximum theatrics. Maximum and then he Roddy. Goes, oh, you're six foot five? I, I bet you weren't six foot... I bet you weren't even six foot tall. I bet you were five foot six. No, even less than that. So I thought, <laughs> yeah. this is mad. This is five foot four. Far. I think yeah, you were yeah. five feet. It's bizarre. Yeah. And, and then I've just put down... This is incredible. Height, shade, <laughs> sees off the ghost. Yeah. That's it. Just going, oh, you're so short. Are you so short? Ha, 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 ha. You're short, weren't you? Yes. And somehow, again, not explained, that does for him. Yes. And the ghost, that, and the ghost is expunged. And, the, and a, a window smashes. Smashes. And they find this kind of hidden room yeah. where TV's Michael Goff. Goff, yep. Um, star of um, Batman. Yep. And um, Horror Hospital, amongst others, and the original uh, Hammer Dracula. And Doctor yep. Who, several Doctor Who stories. He's a ter- terrible actor. The Celestial Toymaker, I'm glad he didn't act in this film because he's one of the worst actors that ever did <laughs> acting to film. Um, he's just sat in this room then, isn't yeah. he? And he's just, mummified. Like, and I, well, that was it for a moment. I was like, shit, is, it gonna, is the twist... He's been alive the whole yes, time. all this time. That was my, I was like, oh, is it like a double it, twist? Yes. And he's just been be behind it all and ha, 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 ha. Yeah. I was like, oh, no, he is dead. Yeah. Yes. He's dead. He's dead. He's mummified. And then he goes, yeah. Ronnie, Ma- Ronnie McDowell goes, allow me to try something. And yeah. he cuts open his trousers to yeah. reveal two false legs. Yes. <laughs> but why? Yeah, legs. How did he work that out? No well, idea. he then turns around, he goes, and I've written it down. <laughs> Surely so, the weirdest reveal at the end of any film in film history. The weirdest motivation for Spoilers, anything. Spoilers, if you, if you don't, go and watch oh, it. Oh, no, come on. Yeah, uh, right, he no. just put, he so despised his shortness. He had his own legs amputated <laughs> and these false legs attached to make him look taller. Taller. What? Who the fuck does this? <laughs> what precedence just, is there for this? Just look, do what Prince did. Just wear some really high heels. Yeah, yeah. Tom you Cruise. Know, mate, Tom Cruise. Just like, there's ways around this that didn't but require. It... And then did that put a limit on his his sexual deviance? <laughs> I mean, false legs. That's what I want. I mean, he can never uh, took his trousers off during all of these. Um, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Maybe that's so, why he was so cross. At this point, you are basically left with. Um, so this is where I've written Michael Goff, three uh, exclamation marks, like and then marks. all I've written is why. Uh, yeah. And it's like, so why? What have you written, Jane? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> so the leg reveal. Your whole, you get to the end of the film, and if you're thinking about any of this process, you're thinking, why is this man haunting this house? House. Because it's. Evil. it's <laughs> But it's, and he's pissed off about being short. It just doesn't make any sense at all, does mad, it? Like, mad, what is his mad, motivation mad. for any of this? Like, was he kind of conducting experiments into life after death? Did he know that he would well, survive as a spirit? Because he did have, or, per, he, because he led line, led line that room. Line, because yeah. apparently he knew that someone would. Come, come in and with the machine with the electromagnetic magnetic, magnetic machine but a lead line room won't let the machine in but it will let his ghost out, out. like none of it makes actual no. sense no. within no. 
So within the dynamic of a film, you've got to have something that makes sense within the dynamic of the film. I yes. Mean, for the film to yeah. work. And yeah. none, none of this works. There's no logic. There's, There's zero absolutely logic. Just, no logic. It just feels like lots of, lots of stuff happens at the end. Yes. It's like if it, it's, it's, loads it's of reveals, like, not set up at all. Yeah. It is yeah. almost, it, it's a phrase that gets overused, but it, it does almost feel like a fever dream. It's just like dream yeah. logic. And then we brought in a machine to get rid of the ghosts. But but the machine didn't work on all the ghosts. Yeah. Uh, but, but then I figured out that the, the whole thing was that he was just in there on his own. And if I just yeah. shouted at him for being short, that would get rid of him. And then I found his body and it turned out that he didn't have any legs. Like, what the hell is this? And, it, and what he'd actually done was had his own legs cut off. Off. And then he'd put what? fake legs on to make so it look So if he looked out of proportion, do you reckon he looked like someone? Yeah. And well, he, he, look, he looked like Jaws, basically, didn't he? <laughs> do you reckon like this is was... what... But, you know, evil legless men kill people. You know, is this the Oscar Pistorius sort of like... <laughs> oh, <laughs> good boy, Ross. The, almost, the Blade Runner. Almost current. Mm. Um, R- roses are red, violets are glorious. Don't sneak up on Oscar Pistorius. <laughs> 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 I... And they leave, they leave the house, turn the machine on with the door open so they can wipe him for good. Um, Supposedly. Yeah. The end. And, yes. then, and then Christmas Eve, the end. End. But at, at that point, there's no kind of, um, there's no dialogue about, oh, we've proved ghosts. Or, exactly. Like, the oh, machine are we going to go works. back and tell, yeah, are we yeah. going to go back and tell the old guy? It's Guess just what? like. You're fine. Don't, don't worry about dying. Definitely ghosts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You'll survive. Carry on. Uh, it just, it starts off as a really good film. And I've got to say that I did really enjoy this film, but I think there's such massively fundamental flaws with it. It's really difficult to kind of, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, what can you say about it, really? And, and it, it's the pace, it, it's got no real decent pacing. And for a no. horror film, there's no actual scares or even just there's no atmosphere. Scares. Yeah. There's, there's no atmosphere to it, which sometimes is what you want, isn't it? Like I'd say the theme. first 40 minutes no. builds up a really film, a really good film, which it then totally fails really to deliver. <laughs> oh, gonna, should we give some marks then? I yes. think we should. And then I'm going to do my big reveal about Alan Hugh. Okay. Right. Cool. So I, I put down three or four because um, I, I thought it just looked great. Um, you fancy that girl. I had a massive crush on that girl. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, God. And yeah, I, I I liked it. I I liked the crazy, the weirdness and the craziness of it. But you've talked me down on this one, so I'm going to keep. Ah. It, I'm going to put a three. Wow, wow. Okay. John, that was five. Uh, ultimately, I think it's enjoyable, if a bit of a farce. And I think I can't remember what it's relative to, but I'm going to say two point five. Two point five. So it's better than you mm. expected as well. And you're you're. It's far better than I expected because it's a different film <laughs> to what I remember. <laughs> yeah. James, it's going to be a low one for you, isn't it? Oh, well, I suppose it's some great cinematography, which I'm sure John's probably going to tell us about. You know, said that there were times where you thought, wow, that looks really good. And Delia Derbyshire, that soundtrack, mm-hmm. you know, when, when you do get to hear it, is really, really good. Well, then, yeah, the rest of it is, is crazy fast. So for me, <laughs> uh, uh, um, so for me, it's a two. A two. Oh. Yeah. Mid-range it's film. Not, yeah, it's a mid-range film. I think it's an enjoyable film and there's lots to enjoy in it. Roddy McDowell's performance is, yeah. particularly is really good with not very much material, but I think mm. ultimately, like, it's the story is just written on the back all of the bag packet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if Nigel Neal had written it, I think it would have been an all-time great, but whoever Richard Matheson is, I think, did he also do I Am Legend with... Um, yes. And did he do the one with Charlton Heston as well? Was that him? That's um, the uh, the Omega Man. I think that's that slightly... is I Am Legend. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the same story, isn't it? So Alan Hume. Mm. So we've all said about how how good this film looks, and I was like, I looked at the director and I thought this director has done nothing really. So I mm. looked at the DOP, and he started off in 1960. His second film carry on regardless Whoa. I thought interesting then he did a film called Twice Round the Daffodils which is a romantic comedy which I adore which is set in a TB hospital right and if you were cured of TB what you could do was walk twice round the daffodils within the garden of this hospital and you would 
be allowed to be discharged. It's a brilliant film. It's got Shirley Eaton, who's a real pin-up. She's the, mm. the lady who gets painted gold in gold thing. Gold oh, she's, she's one of the nurses. So then we've got Carry On Cruising. We've got Nurse on Wheels. We've got Kiss of the Vampire, a hammer film. We've got Carry On Cabby, which is probably the best Carry On film. Uh-huh. Carry On Jack, Carry On Spying, Carry On Cleo. Then we've got um, Dr. Terror's House of Horrors. So this all starts, and you're like, wow. He also directs, he also was the DOP of Carry On Screaming, yeah. which is why this film reminded me of Carry On Screaming, because it's the same guy that shot it. So scrolling up his IMDb now, Carry On Doctor, Father Dear Father, did some Avengers. He then did the feature film version of For the Love of Ada, which, oh. is, an in, which is an insane um, sitcom, which is being repeated on Talking Pictures. So we're scrolling up. He did Carry On Henry VIII. Um, he did Carry On Abroad. He did Bless This House, the TV movie. Oh. He did The Legend of Hell House. He did Carry On Girl. He did The Land That Time Forgot. These are Ooh, all his films. Classic. He did Carry On. He did Confessions of a Pop Performer. Oof. He did At the Earth's Fall. He did a film that both of you will probably love, which is called Warlords of the Deep. Have you seen that? It's no. Called no. Warlords of, it's called Warlords of Atlantis in Britain, and it's absolutely amazing. I'm sure you have seen it. He did Carry On Emmanuel. <laughs> wow. He kills the Carry On franchise then. In the end. We, we're getting to the best part now. So then, what was he the DO, DOP of? For your eyes only. Oh. <laughs> cool. So he went from the carry-on films and this to for your eyes only. Then he did, he's credited in loads of episodes of Carry On Laughing. Do you remember Carry On yeah, Laughing, yeah. which was like yeah. a compilation? Nation. Yeah. Then he, in 1983 and 1982, guess the films that he... he Helmed in Ooh. those years, DOP. So, was were they more Bond films? Yeah. Was it, so, what Octopussy. View, view to a Octopussy. kill. Octopussy. <laughs> view to a kill. View to a kill. He did in 1985. Oh. What other film did he do in 1982, 83? Forward to Flash. Flash Gordon. No. no. Bigger, much bigger than that. James, you're going to get this. Oh, Empire Strikes Back. No. 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 Right. no. But Don't you're know. in the. You're very much in the right. I don't know. Give Return us a clue. Return of the Jedi. Whoa! Did he? So the man that was the DOP on Carry On Emmanuel was the DOP <laughs> for Return of Return the of Jedi. Return of the Jedi. Amazing. <laughs> wow. Imagine having career. that CV. He worked with Sid James. And Jabba the Hutt. And he worked with George Lucas <laughs> and Jabba the Hutt. What so he also did need? Supergirl. Wow. Um, he did View to a Kill. He did Life Force. Do you remember Life Force? Or Life Real Force, yeah. Film? Patrick Stewart's in that, yeah. He did Hearts on Fire, which is the director of um, Return of the Jedi, and Bob Dylan. Yes, and I was about to say, that's the Some point. of that was filmed and in the Ronda. Was it? Yeah, it's and that's got Rupert Jordan. Everett in it, hasn't it? Yes, it's Rupert it Everett and Bob Dylan together at last. Then yeah. he was the DOP on the Jack the Ripper miniseries with Michael Caine. Oh. Which Michael Caine got paid a million pounds. We need to, to do, do that. I love that. And then he did Shirley Valentine. Wow. So he, um, he went from shooting like Tantooine yeah. to shooting <laughs> someone's kitchen wall. Yeah. Then he did Stepping Out with Liza Minnelli, Harry on oh. Columbus. Oh, God. <laughs> Came back, um, brought him back. Space Precinct, which isn't something that's that Jerry I... Anderson. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. TV series. I had some um, props from that. He did two episodes of Tales from the did Crypt. You? Yeah, and then he did the TV movie of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, and then he retired in nineteen ninety seven. He died in twenty ten. Oh. So wow. just imagine what that's a career. Yeah. yeah, that's an amazing career, isn't it? He did Harry and Cabby and Return of the Another Jedi. Jedi. I, like see who, I wonder if he's done, got, his, got a biography. Oh, amazing. I'd love to see. But just imagine looking through his CV and like, oh, this is the guy that we've, we've had his, his um, application in for Return of the Jedi. And it's like, carry on, Emmanuel. <laughs> well, I'm a really big fan of the carry on movies. So that's my choice, Luke. <laughs> well, basically, I think basically he's been working in this studio nonstop since 1960. Yes. So it, it's basically Pinewood or Elstree or yeah. somewhere like that, isn't it? And it's like, oh, this is the guy you need, Alan Hume. He's a laugh. Yeah. He did carry on Cappy. 
And it's like Return of the Jedi. Fantastic. Supergirl. Amazing. For your eyes only. View to a Kill, which is one of my favourite films of all time. <laughs> um, Max Zorin laughing as he dies. <laughs> <laughs> Grace Jones. Oh, Grace Jones. Um, Mayday. Wrestling a, and, and wrestling a horse. She sort of wrestles <laughs> a horse into submission, doesn't she? Uh, 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 the, yeah, and flips uh, Roger Moore onto his back. Flips Roger was, Moore, yeah. It gave me some very strange feelings. Oh, that happened. it was edited out when it was shown on ITV. I think it went to the adverts at that point. Yeah, <laughs> imagine what <laughs> Prince Charles felt when he saw that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, I thought you'd enjoy that. Um, Brilliant. That is like a, um, a, a, a tra- trajectory of... Um, British cinema, isn't it? Yeah. Like yeah. the greats of comedy, then just crap sex films in the 1970s when no yeah. one in Britain went to the cinema. And then Star Wars, which basically well, and then saved... Blockbusters. Yeah, yeah, which yeah, saved yeah. cinema in Britain because yeah. no one was making films in Britain at that point. They were all just crap. Mm. Confessions of a window cleaner and stuff like that. Sex films. Sex films. Right, so um, has anyone seen or read or or? Yeah, uh, I've, got, I've got one. Oh, I okay. think it's right. My, my one is uh, on Netflix at the moment. Mm. Is the series Archive Eighty One? Yes, it's very good. Which mm. I've watched, I know you've been watching it as well. It started off as a podcast, and I on you know these things that uh, things like the Guardian and the New Statesman do when they kind of say, oh, you know, what's coming up in the in in the year to the, in the, the year ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh Christ, not in this lifetime. Um, but yes, you know, that whole kind of what's coming up this year, what should you be looking out for? It was listed as one of the things that was like, oh, this could be potentially really good. And obviously it's right up our room. And the, the, the plot is a man who is an archivist and is really, really skilled at restoring video and audio tape is commissioned by this very mysterious company to, right, um, to go through these videos which were kind of caught up in this building fire that happened back in the 1990s. And as he starts to watch the videos, as he kind of restores the videos, he finds out that he has a link to it. He has a surprising link to the, to the mm. story himself. And it's like, oh, you know, what's mm. the larger plot at play here? And at the same time as well, as you're seeing those videos, kind of the, the story takes you back into the 1990s. And even though I said I'm only two episodes into it at the mm. moment, but I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. It's 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 very classy. Yeah. It's, mm, it was, it's it's hokum, but it's it's very well made. Hokum, hokum. is a good. Yeah. Uh, and I I found that there's kind of lost vibes in it as well because he where he's been sent to do these tapes, it's like a, a strange kind of like remote installation with like with rooms in it which. You know, which are locked away and like tunnels underneath the ground and stuff. Mm. And, and, yes. and the company is a front for a science testing company, you know, kind of yeah. a scientific organization. So, yeah, there's, there's plenty of that. And I just thought, oh, this is good. And there's much to do with witchcraft and yeah. things such as that. Cults and, and, and stuff. Cults. Mm. So lots of, lots of, the only, my, one of the criticisms is when it goes back to the 90s, it doesn't look 90s enough. Mm. Because we're all old enough <laughs> to have lived through them and be, I'm like... Now, this just looks like now. Yeah. It, they haven't really because everyone gone... dresses like they're in the 90s now. Even I them. guess. But I think in terms of yeah. haircuts and things like that, I did think mm, this doesn't really look very 90s. Ha- some haircuts were disgusting in the 90s, weren't they? Like center they partings, like curtains. Yeah, my, oh, yeah. Hair, my hair keeps trying to do that. Yeah, oh. I yeah, had the only, it as well. The, the only thing that I've seen so far, apart from the actual video camera that's used and things such as that, is that one of the, the men in the 90s has got a... Uh, a collarless shirt on. I was yeah. like, oh yeah, they oh, were. Yeah, I had a lot of those from, Ma- from Matland. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. And uh, Foster's. John, I think they, I think the girl uses the, um, the Sony camcorder you used, used to have. Oh, the Hi8 one. Yeah. So it's worth watching just for that. Yeah. Well, I, I had that camcorder. Well, I think I've still got it, actually. I think I'm still transcribing videos from it as we speak. Uh, it costs an awful lot of money. Yes. <laughs> um, I have, I'm still reading E.F. Benson's collected ghost stories, which is called mm-hmm. Night Terrors. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some really, really excellent ones in there. And he does some really interesting things quite early on with, I think, the tropes of particularly ghosts, where he kind of predicts future ghosts. And I don't know if he's the Ooh. first person to kind of play around with the idea of ghosts from the future rather than ghosts from the past. Um there's a very, very good one, which is set in Egypt, where, uh, and, and I thought of our podcast, actually, while I was reading this, a guy, I won't tell you what happens in the story, and I can't remember the title of it either, 
but a guy is haunted by a figure who um, doesn't have a face, mm-hmm. which is very like Ooh, um, Sapphire and Steel. Sapphire and Steel, the, the episode that we that we watched, and that's a really effective ghost story. Uh, I won't say the ending or anything. Um, and maybe by the time we do the next podcast, I'll find out what the story is called. Fantastic. So you can all read it. The other cool. thing that we've been watching is um, a thing called Shadows of Fear. has been repeated um, late at night on a Friday, I think, on Talking Pictures in what's called the Cellar Club, which they've got Ross Cleaver's favourite lady from um, Dracula 18, 1972. She looks a bit different now. She looks a very attractive older woman still, um, but she doesn't look the same as she looked in 1972, which, you know, it is 50 years ago, so you can't really expect it to. But, um, so it's... um, it's a bit of a. Have I mentioned? Did I mention this in the last podcast? I feel like no, I've no, no, about no, this no, 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 no. So it's like a horror. It's not really a horror anthology. Um, it's like thrillers. They're a bit like um, tales of the unexpected, mm-hmm. but they're about an hour long. They were done by Thames TV in 1971. Um, there was there's one absolutely mental episode, which is hard to describe. But it, it's the, the star of it is a guy who went on to be in the X-Files in like the mid 90s. Mm-hmm. So it's really weird watching this guy in the Thames TV production from like 1971. And I'm thinking, I'm sure I recognize this guy. And I looked at his CV and then he was in the X-Files in like 1995 or something. Mm. But um, there's some really good episodes in that. Shadows of Fear. It's like um, very small casts, usually totally set bound. And it's just about writing and it's just about narrative mm-hmm. and weird things happening. Um, just like weird twist endings. So it's very, very Tales of the Unexpected, but it's it's a bit longer. And those are well worth watching. And it's got a really good title music and it's got a really good title sequence, which looks a bit like some of the uh, sequences from Yellow Submarine. <laughs> <laughs> Like animated terrace houses yeah. and stuff and Eleanor weird Rigby. figures. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Very Eleanor Rigby. I've been watching Woodland Stark and Days Bewitched, the yes. history of folk horror, which is, I think it's about three, four hours long documentary. Three hours. Paul yeah. Skirm sent it to me on Facebook and I was like, oh, this looks amazing. It is really good. It's it's on Shudder in the UK. I don't know how else you can watch it. Um, I would say the first two thirds are brilliant. Um, and I've just got, I've been having it playing in the corner of my screen and I'm just writing down all these things that we got to watch. Mm. Great. <laughs> then it kind of rushes through at the last third of like folk horror from all different countries, like Japan, Spain. Oh all, and it's yeah. like, right. it's all, all you're doing now is just listing things. That's what it felt like to me. Boop, boop, yeah. boop, boop, and it was like too much stuff. I can't, can't take this all in. Um, it's mm. almost like th- these needed their own separate documentaries. Yes. But that being said, it's just full of, great stuff and there's some really really interesting sort of theories around um there's a guy i think he wrote a book called folk horror we don't go back we, we can't go back or something like that and basically his theory is that um we're so good with notes on this podcast, yeah, aren't yeah, we? I, know. I can't remember the name of this story it's a good that's a good sound effect please like looking through R- rummaging through my uh, yeah we don't draws. go back it's called cool sorry we don't go back that's his book. um who's the we he's referring to uh, us you us three um <laughs> so but, uh, his sort of thing is that he said uh, in these in these uh folk horror is all about finding stuff from the past he said often you you dig you're, you're digging something out of the ground or, or you're finding something from the past and it's almost like there's all these gods and beliefs and things from the past and mm. we, we can't go back and look at those things because if we do and those things turn out to be real or we mm. convince ourselves they're real it's almost like all the things in our modern life which um has structure and, and it's got science mm. and, and, and there's like reason behind it if you go back and those things start to become real mm. we're gonna lose you, 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 complete, you completely lose rationality you lose the plot and anything can happen and, and that's 
Uh, That's basically every Nigel Neal yeah. teleplay ever written. Yeah. So it's just, and that, I, I really like, love that idea. Yes. Um, I think anything that's about um, a supernatural or occult or uncanny um, strata underneath the kind of veneer of modernism is always fascinating. Mm, yeah. I think Hell and I are going to watch this, um, uh, Children of the Stones okay. uh, soon. Well, uh, I, I'm happy to do that for the podcast again. If you yeah, want yeah. I think it's quite long, though, isn't it? It is long, yeah. yeah. And, How well, many episodes are there? Uh, at least four, maybe six. Yeah. But it's got a great, like, homina, 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 homina. Yeah. 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 I think, so we're going to watch that soon, because I think that's um, something that uh, Hell will enjoy. It, it reminded me again, and I cannot find any proof of this, mm. of the episode... The storyline in EastEnders where they found a mummified baby bricked up in <laughs> Pauline's house. <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> but why is it such a strong memory of mine? I will ask Helen because Helen is friends with someone who will know if that's the but truth. I'm pretty or not, sure. Away. Um, it but was, that is that is an that is an episode of a Nigel Neal drama, you know. Yeah, that, the baby is from Beasts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but yeah, it, yeah. I can remember because it was, I think it was dot, an abortion <laughs> dot had or something. And and that <laughs> Pauline's house was haunted, or and they no, <laughs> this, uh, it sounds amazing. <laughs> and they it's found like this, Ghost Watch, and they it's found this number five baby like wrapped up in muslin or something. It does sound like a brilliant crossover, but I don't think it's real. Next time on Gemma Witchfinders, we will be watching the Oblong Box. I'm very excited for you to which is share this. Something which we've been talking about watching from the very beginning i think it was put down as our third thing to watch and it's yeah. just been shunted through this up the schedule so it's a it's a it's a towering achievement in filmmaking and hopefully it will be my first um vincent price film i might like well he's a, he's the romantic lead in this yeah. with a woman who is um interestingly you to mention this it's the same team i think pretty much that were behind um which find a general yeah so it's vincent price the star lady and i think the same director and the same production team cool, cool. and and the and the lady whose name i can't remember um they re they were really trying to push her as a star and she i think she became an agent and moved to la and became quite famous as an agent but um it's brilliant just for how incongruous vincent price is as like a romantic lead um in a heterosexual way with a woman who looks about 22 and he looks about 600 at this point. All right, okay, well, next time <laughs> we will have maybe a bit more information on that film. <laughs> on that bombshell. Bye, everyone. Happy Love, day. Love, light, and peace. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Happy Stay day. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Live long and prosper. You have been listening to The General Witchfinders. <laughs>production company john no all i want you to do i say sex films and then this podcast just stops <laughs> well maybe not on this episode but yeah. when, when we have when we the finish, final ever episode, episode. episode. <laughs> we're we'll just sex films. That was just one episode two, it'd be, it'd two seconds like, long it'd be like the end of the sopranos <laughs> just suddenly sex films bang why did it end like that <laughs> oh, oh what did it mean yeah like um what was that thing you were obsessed with, Cleves? And I can't remember. And then lost. There was a, there was a yeah. There was a. Ice, I'm wearing a lost. Wearing a lost T-shirt now. What? <laughs> what was it? There was an iceberg or polar bear or something in it, wasn't there? Yeah, that's right. Sex film. Sex film. Sex film.